Today on Revelation to Transformation. The sky, but for some people right now, there is a darkness in their soul and in their heart that is so dark that not a light of a thousand suns couldn't find a place and a home inside of them. And it has nothing to do with what we think it has to do with. See, we have it as their drug addicts and their alcoholics and their fornicators and their homosexuals and they're living in dark. But I'm not talking about their actions. I'm talking about some people who are highly moral, who wouldn't do some of the things that we think are sin in a thousand years. No way, no way, because they were taught better than that, bless God. But there's still a darkness in their heart and in their soul. And even though they may be moral in the eyes of What is meant by the term salvation? And what are some ways to effectively share your faith with others? Pastor Paul White was recently asked to submit six 30-minute sermons aimed at an audience of unbelievers in order to introduce them to the gospel of Jesus Christ. These sermons are currently airing on an international Christian satellite network with a potential audience of over one billion people. Now you can own these six sermons on DVD as study tools for effective evangelism or share them with friends and loved ones who need to hear the good news about God's love and Christ's sacrifice. This six DVD set can be yours for only $30 plus $5 shipping and handling. Contact us today at 1-877-244-3353 or order online at www.paulwhiteministries.org. And I appreciate it so much. That's good work. Good, good work. Are you ready for some word today? All right, all right. I'm ready to put some bread on the table for you this morning. Hopefully feed your spirit man a little bit. Prepare your hearts for another week. Uh, focus you on Jesus and His loveliness and His beauty. The Gospel of Jesus Christ is the single... I know this is an opinionated statement, but it's an opinion that I've formed in a lifetime of uh, hearing the good news and preaching the good news and being around the good news. The Gospel of Jesus Christ is the single greatest thing that a man can release from his mouth that has a permanent effect on his world. You can be good to people. You can be nice to people. You can inspire people. All of that stuff's wonderful. Nothing changes the world like the good news of a man named Jesus. He comes into the lives and hearts. He begins a transformation that isn't from the outside in, but from the inside out, and it is a glorious thing. With that said, we focus like a laser beam the attention and the light on a man named Jesus every time we preach. But there's an undeniable aspect of the gospel that I don't want you to forget. And that is your response. Because you see, the gospel of Jesus Christ, as wonderful and as beautiful as it is, demands a response. Either acceptance or rejection. A man hears the gospel, it's a beautiful thing, but he can say no. He can say, I don't want that. I, I, I have no desire for this man named Jesus. He can, he can reject it in hand. He can reject it passively. He can reject it vehemently. He can reject it mock. And God doesn't strike him down with lightning and tear him up and, and take his home and break his legs and all the things that sometimes people think God might do. He, he doesn't do that. You don't want the gospel, you don't have to have the gospel. Or you can embrace the gospel, accept the gospel by faith, and things happen. Either way, you have to deal with this man named Jesus. Jesus was so adamant about it, him being dealt with that in John 3 he said, here's the condemnation. The condemnation is that men are in the dark, but I've come to show them the light. If they reject the light, there's their condemnation. Notice Jesus didn't even say men are condemned for what they're doing. Jesus said men are condemned for what they reject. Very easy for us in the church to look at the outside world and say, look at what all those sinners are doing today. They're condemned. That's not the case at all. Their condemnation is not in their actions today, but in the rejection of the light of a man named Jesus. And so there might even be a lot of people who never really had the light shined into their darkness. Why don't we give them a chance? In other words, my title kind of says it all today. There's a sunrise and a sunset, results of an encounter with Jesus. For some people, when they meet Him, it is a sunrise. For some people, when they meet Him, it is the first step towards sunset. 
It is a lifetime of darkness from that moment on because they've rejected the ultimate light. I want to apologize to my Wednesday crew and for those who listen to the Wednesday nights, which I know is a lot of our listeners, but I'm going to cover some material that I've hit for several Wednesdays. And for my podcast listeners, I'm right up on, in the middle of some stuff I just covered in my podcast. That's because that stuff is fresh on my heart and sometimes it needs, I need more than four and a half minutes with it. That's what I get in a podcast setting. And then I stop and then I go do another one for four and a half minutes and, and uh, I need a little more time to develop it. I've had a sermon brewing on my heart now for a month about Judas Iscariot, the most infamous character in the Bible, famous for all the wrong reasons. And the more that I've studied him and prepared my heart to minister on him a little bit, the more I could not divorce him from another character in the Bible. And it's not Jesus. We think Judas and Jesus are the characters that go together. But the more I could not divorce him from Simon Peter. Now, I, I do this because my, my title of Sunrise and Sunset is to show you two distinct ways of encountering Jesus. Two ways in which when you meet Him, you either walk into a sunrise of your future, or when you meet Him, you live in the sunset of your past. And every one of us had to make a decision what we were going to do with Christ, and every one of us continues to make that decision even today based upon how we're going to deal with our tomorrows. Are we going to live in our past? Are we going to move on into our future? And an encounter with Jesus is what equips us to do that. Judas Iscariot is probably the world's most hated name. Uh, it, it even ranks higher on the list of names than Adolf Hitler. And in our last hundred years, there wasn't much worse in our culture than that word. But parents don't name their children Judas because of the connotations of one who would betray Christ, even though his name, Judas, is a Greek form of his Hebrew name, Judah. Jesus came from the tribe of Judah. So in his day, his name was not unusual. In fact, it was praiseworthy. Would you like to know what the word Judah means in the Hebrew? Praise. And so Judas' very existence should have revolved around praise. But when we think of Judas, we think of one event, which rightfully we should. That event of a man who basically stabbed Jesus in the back, sold him for 30 pieces of silver. We might go on with his story to see him throwing the money into the floor of the temple. We might even take him to his hanging. We'll do all that today. But in most of our minds, it doesn't go any further than a man who was a snake in the grass, who got Jesus uh, in a vulnerable moment, betrayed him to his enemies, and then ended up with him on the cross. At running the risk this morning of sounding too compassionate to Judas, if I may, let me sound a bit compassionate to Judas. And that is, Judas was a man not a whole lot like, unlike the rest of us. He had had an encounter with Jesus. Judas was there in those intimate moments when Jesus talked to his disciples one-on-one -on -one when he answered questions. Judas was part of the group when Jesus sent his disciples out two by two and laid his hands on them and anointed them with the Spirit so that they could go out and cast out devils and heal the sick. I know I'm being imaginative here, but it's possible that Judas and Peter were two that went out together and went and stood on the street corners in these villages around Jerusalem and healed the sick and raised the dead. I don't know that for sure, but I know that they were both involved. I don't know if they were together, but they were both involved. Judas would go out and perform great miracles at the, at the bequest and name of Jesus. And yet, when we think of him, it's only in terms of him being a traitor. Peter! Another man who is, in some respects, famous for all the wrong reasons. Most of us think of Peter as a sort of a tempestuous, temperamental guy. Very possible, but in reality, at, at times too, Peter overplayed his hand, spoke when he should have kept his mouth shut, asked questions when he should have just been waiting on answers. Um, Peter was a guy who we associate with walking on the water and going to the top of the Mount of Transfiguration and falling asleep in the Garden of Gethsemane and all the other stuff that he did. But we also know that it was Peter whom Jesus said before the rooster crows, 
tomorrow morning you will have denied me. And we know that Peter goes and warms his hand by the fire while Jesus a hundred feet away is being sold, uh, judged in Pilate's hall. Peter denies that he even knows the Lord. Curses God and st standing in that courtyard that night and then runs into the darkness knowing that he has just failed. Yet, when we look back, we don't look back on such hatred with Peter as we do with Judas. Why? Judas sells Jesus out. Peter denies Jesus. Both had acted as if Jesus was not near as important as you and I think that he is, near as special as you and I think that he is. And I say to you the reason why we hold Peter in such high regard and the reason why we push Judas to such low regard is because of the way that they dealt with their encounter. Both were failures. Both had problems. Both are a lot like you and me. Not perfect, don't always make great decisions, and sometimes we have a few moments in our past we'd rather not talk about. How many of you got a couple of those? Don't, you don't have to raise your hand, and we're certainly not going to come around and ask you what they are, but we got a few incidents somewhere back there we don't want discussed. I want to put these two guys up next to each other today with Jesus in the center. Jesus is the central figure of the story. Judas Iscariot's dealings with Jesus, Simon Peter's dealings with Jesus. We can't go verse by verse, word by word, through all the Gospels of every single dealing that they had. So I want to confine it to one chapter, one snapshot in time where both Judas and Peter had an encounter with Jesus on the same night at the same dinner table, and both had their moment. One was a sunset, and one was a sunrise. And when we're done today, maybe you'll be able to walk out of the sunset of your life and into the sunrise of your future with Jesus in the center. Are you ready? Let's go to the Last Supper. John chapter 13, one of the spectacular moments in this unbelievable book of John. It is so incredible as to be rendered unbelievable at times. It's so well written, so many amazing stories. But by faith, I believe it's the greatest snapshot of the life of Jesus. And when Jesus has just communed with the disciples regarding foot washing, he says in John 13 and 21, when Jesus said these things, He was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Now this had to be a, quite a drop in the attitude of the room, if you can imagine. Jesus had just come fresh off of foot washing. They just had a miraculous revelation that servanthood is the purpose of the kingdom. And then out of his mouth comes the statement, one of you will betray me. Can you imagine 12 of you, best friends, sitting in a room with the man you followed for three and a half years intimately? You've given your, you've sacrificed your life, your careers for. And yet in that moment of his final hour, he looks at that circle and says, one of you shall betray me. 22. Then the disciples looked at one another, perplexed about whom he spoke. Maybe no verse is more telling than verse 22 to the perceived innocence of Judas up until that moment. Because no one in the room, as of John 13, 22, knew that it was Judas. There was nothing in his demeanor that told them, watch out for this cat. He's going he's to betray Jesus at any moment. In fact, the other Gospels say that the disciples looked amongst themselves and said to the Lord, is it I? Which means that even John the Beloved looked at the Lord Jesus that night and said, Lord, is it me? that's going to betray you. Everyone in that room felt like they were on equal footing with everyone else in that room. They all felt like they had been used of God. They all knew they had problems and failures. They had all failed publicly in many cases in the life and ministry of Jesus. Not one in that room looked at Judas from the, out of the gate and said, he must be the one. In fact, they all wondered if they were the one who might fail. And I, I want you to know that we're all capable of amazing things due to the divine nature that's in us. But because of the mentality of the first father, Adam, we're all capable of miserable things as well. And don't ever forget, that. I'm not saying that so that you'll be passive regarding people's mistakes, but so that you'll understand that people make them and you'll be able to love them in spite of those mistakes. That even in this room, Judas Iscariot was not the one everyone pointed to. 23. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. We know, based upon the volume of the book, that this is the author of the book, John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. 24. 
Simon Peter therefore motioned to him to ask who it was of whom he spoke. I'll not get into the implications in this sermon of these verses, but there's some powerful things here about proximity to Jesus that is worth your study, and I'd cover that in the pods the last few days online. 25. Then leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said to him, Lord, who is it? The question has now been asked, can you just identify your betrayer? 26. Jesus answered, it is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Very simple action that has often been misinterpreted by modern day readers. Notice that Jesus tears bread, dips it in sop, somewhat like oil for us, sitting at a table with bread, and hands it over to Judas Iscariot. He has just said, the one to I hand the bread is the one who will betray me. 27, seems like it should be obvious, right? 27, now after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. Then Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. A lot of people have been thrown off by John 13, 27 because it says Satan entered him. And they say, I didn't think Satan being a created being could possess or enter someone else. I don't believe that's the purpose of this verse, is to try to get us into a spiritual argument about whether or not Satan can possess people. Uh, because that gets us into a whole can of worms. Can someone cast out devils one day and be possessed of the devil the next day? That is not what the gospel is trying to explain to or away in this text. But Satan, to a Hebrew, was the word ha-satan when written in Hebrew. And ha-satan meant the accuser. And so what they are, are, are the adversary. So the adversary that's been fighting against Jesus his entire earthly ministry is still fighting against Jesus, but now doing so through the actions of one of his own disciples. Jesus says, what you do, do quickly. 28. But no one at the table, this is interesting, no one at the table knew for what reason he said this to them. Now, based upon what you and I have just read together, doesn't it seem pretty obvious? Jesus said, if I dip the bread and then hand it, that's the guy. And yet he dips the bread, hands it, and says, do what you do quickly. And no one at the table gets it, which tells me Jesus was dipping bread and handing it to everyone. Okay, over the course of the night, he had probably shared with everyone the sop. So when Jesus said, it's he to whom I dip and give, he was saying, it's one of you. That didn't answer their question very well, did it? It's one of you. But no one at the table knew for what reason he said this to them, 20, him, 29. For some thought because Judas had the money box that Jesus said to him, buy the things that we need for the feast or that he should give something to the poor. This lets us know that Judas was the treasurer of this little group, that he carried the money that they had. Uh, and we know, according to earlier in John, that in his heart he was a thief because he one time sat at a meal and watched a woman sacrifice a box of perfume at the feet of Jesus. She, she broke the box open and poured it on his feet, and the Bible tells us the price of it, and the price of it was the equivalent of one year's salary and Judas looked at it and thought, man, what a waste. Surely we should have done something else with that. And a lot of us cut Judas down, but let's be honest. If you were in a room and someone walked in with a $50,000 bottle of perfume and shattered it on the floor so that they could anoint somebody, it might cross your mind a $5 bottle would have sufficed. Now, maybe you're just better than me, but uh, I, it might have crossed my mind, wow, that was a very expensive praise. Surely a little less expensive praise could have worked, and then we could have used some of that money to build the church. Judas isn't really that far off from a lot of our religious thinking. Surely we could have uh, done something better with that money then give it away. I, 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 I have heard that in the church for years. Unfortunately, we're in a place where uh, we don't sit and argue about using the money to promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I've seen churches that sit and fight about the usage of money because where we're spending, it's not going to bring any back. You know how many churches are reluctant to fund their youth group because their youth group doesn't tithe? And they'll say they're never going to give the money back 
And we, we're not going to spend it on our kids because they can't give money back. We're a bunch of Judases sitting at the feet of Jesus going, man, it would be a whole lot better to spend money on their parents so they could bring them to church than it would be on the kids whose parents won't come to church because those kids aren't going to give more than 50 cents or a dollar. And we become a business trying to turn a profit and make sure we're not in the red when in reality we're doing the exact same thing Judas did when he said, surely we could have spent the money on more worthwhile things that would have done more good for the rest of the world. And God says when you do it to the least of them, you've done it to me. Don't worry about whether or not you get a return. You're not a business. You're not a Fortune 500 company. You have a Savior who you praise who can do great things. And so, and so our mentality is not really that far off from this guy, although we like to think that we're way more John the Beloved than we are Judas the Betrayer. But not a single disciple in the room could really identify which one of them was close to falling off the rails. And so Jesus, Jesus said, go do what you do quickly. They thought maybe he wanted to give something to the poor. Verse 30. Next verse. Having received the piece of bread. This is one of the darkest verses in the otherwise spectacularly lit up book of John. Having received the piece of bread, he went out immediately. And it was night. And in that statement right there, Judas, I know it was physically night, but I think the reason the author threw it in was there was something spiritual happening. He walked out of the room where the light of the world was sitting. He walked into the darkness where it was night forever. Judas's encounter with Jesus is now over. He will only meet him one more time in his life. And that is when in a few hours he will kiss him on the cheek and turn him over to the soldiers in the middle of the Garden of Gethsemane. And the sweat that drops down Jesus' brow like great drops of blood will touch the lips of Judas as he kisses the cheek of Jesus. No doubt in that final moment when Jesus dares to call him friend, in that final moment after having betrayed Jesus, Judas still has one more opportunity to go back into the room full of light, but walks back once again out into the darkness. And I say to you that there are people today all over the world in which it is night right now. Oh, the sun is beautiful outside today. It's a gorgeous spring day in Missouri. The temperature is perfect. There's not a cloud in the sky, but for some people right now, there is a darkness in their soul and in their heart that is so dark that not a light of a thousand suns couldn't find a place and a home inside of them. And it has nothing to do with what we think it has to do with. See, we have it as their drug addicts and their alcoholics and their fornicators and their homosexuals and they're living in dark. But I'm not talking about their actions I'm talking about some people who are highly moral, who wouldn't do some of the things that we think are sin in a thousand years. No way, no way, because they were taught better than that, bless God. But there's still a darkness in their heart and in their soul. And even though they may be moral in the eyes of the church, they are dark because they've walked out of the presence of Jesus and their experience is one of a sunset, not a sunrise. In their heart, it's been dark from the day that they encountered Him and said no. From the moment that they didn't embrace His abundant life, there's been a darkness. Don't, base, don't judge people based on whether they're in the light or in the dark by whether they got money or whether they got a good job or whether they're healthy or whether they drink or smoke or cuss or sleep around. All the stuff that we always assume means someone's uh, running towards God or away from God. That, that's our failure. We judge based on what we see. That's not whether or not a man's in darkness or light. I, I know people who I've seen set in the church every week who are in the, the, the darkest of darknesses because they've never embraced the light that is available by meeting and knowing Jesus Christ. And yet their hands go up and they praise God and they throw money in offering plates and they work their little religious fingers to the bone and they live in the dark. Do you know who the biggest portrayers and purveyors of darkness in the ministry of Jesus were? Not the prostitutes, the scribes and the Pharisees. It was the prostitutes that when they saw the light of Jesus were glad to bask in it. But it was the Pharisees who every time they walked into the room with that light, they ran screaming out into their darkness as fast as they could go because they rejected the very light of Jesus that would have given them life, that would have given them hope and abundance. 
We can judge the prostitute all we want, but at least at Jesus' feet she finds forgiveness, rests and cries and rejoices on who He is because the light is turned on in her heart and she sees for the first time she doesn't have to sell herself to people who don't care about her. Someone's already paid a great price for her and she can rest at His feet while religion marches by Him every day into their darkness and into their pit and into the stain of who they are. I'm not saying that there aren't sinners out there who are living in a sinful lifestyle and it's darkness. Absolutely, there are sinners who their sin is just another representation of their darkness. It's just another attempt to find the light. But there are also religious people who have had like a Judas encounter with Jesus. They've spent every moment in his presence and never really met him. The issue with Judas compared to Peter is that Judas had spent every moment with Jesus but never had spent one second with Jesus in him. There's a big difference. When he walked out into the night, what he carried with him was the darkness of that night. That's the place where my heart breaks for the church. You see, I'm a lover of the church. I believe she is the greatest hope that the world has to see the kingdom, the church. I believe that if the world is going to see the kingdom of heaven on the earth, it's going to see it through the arm and the feet of the church. That if he is truly our head and we are his hands and his feet, his mouthpiece, then the way that the king is going to sit on his throne in his kingdom is if the church extends that opportunity to a dark world. But I see so many of us sitting in a dark place of our past. There are so many, even under the sound of my voice, both here and around the world, that are doing so little to move forward in their lives because you can, every day of your life you think about the mistake you made yesterday. Every moment of your life, you think about what might have been had you not done that. For some of you, it's a physical moment, a memory etched in time. If they create time travel, you'll go in debt to go back as much as possible. You'll go in debt to go back and have that five-second window over again so you can do that one thing differently because it has stained you and defined you every moment from that day forward. You have been a slave to its darkness. So many of us were bruised at one moment in our life by something, and that moment stayed with us forever. That's why Jesus came and read from Isaiah 61 and said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for He hath anointed me to set at liberty those who are bruised. Have you ever really thought about that statement? Set at liberty those who are bruised. You don't need, why do you need set at liberty? Don't you need healed? Shouldn't He have said to heal those that are bruised? No, He said set at liberty those that are bruised. Why? Because when you get bruised by the cares of this life, by the darkness of this world, you become a slave to yesterday. A slave to that darkness. And you're in chains and you need set free. The liberty that is provided comes by staying in the same place with Jesus, not as Judas running out into the darkness, into a place. Because what happens? What is the end result? Look, look. Show my next scripture. Matthew 27 and 3. Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, he is Jesus. He saw that Jesus had been condemned to go to the cross, was remorseful, and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and to the elders. Verse 4. But by the way, in case you're wondering why 30 pieces of silver... There's a twofold Old Testament reason of which we probably need to preach two whole sermons on. The Hebrews paid 30 pieces of silver as the price of a wounded slave. If your ox wounded your neighbor's slave or servant, you owed your neighbor 30 pieces of silver to pay for the lost labor. So to a Hebrew, the number 30 pieces of silver denoted the price of a wounded slave. When the Pharisees put the price of 30 pieces of silver on Jesus, they weren't even giving him the credit of being a good slave. They were giving him the credit of being a broken one. The second reason is less obvious, but more important. The book of Zechariah, God asked Israel, you want to buy me out of my end of the covenant? Here's what it'll take for you to buy me out of the old covenant. Pay me 30 pieces of silver. 
Don't think for a moment that the Pharisees that had the Old Testament memorized didn't know that the price demanded by Zechariah to pay God out of the Old Covenant was 30 pieces of silver. When they handed that price to Judas, they were not just insulting Jesus by calling him a wounded slave. They were saying if he really is who he says he is, then he can take this back to his father as payment. We want out of this covenant. And God said, fine. You want out? You're out. The biblical narrative is actually formed around 30 pieces of silver. Don't blame that 30-piece quote on Judas. Blame it on those who knew the Old Testament and knew exactly how much to ask. When Judas, who's ignorant of that, realizes that Jesus is to die, brings the 30 pieces of silver back into the temple with remorse. I don't think Judas betrayed Jesus because he thought Jesus needed to die. I believe Judas betrayed Jesus because he thought Jesus was misunderstood. And Jesus needed to have a good set down with the Pharisees. And if he could have a good set down with the Pharisees, they would believe Jesus like he did. But then it all went wrong, and they didn't want to sit down with Jesus. They wanted to kill him. And so Judas walks into that temple with guilt and money, and he throws one of them on the floor and should have threw them both. Do you see? Do you understand that? Why that statement's important? Because when you come into the temple, the temple, the presence of the Holy Spirit, when you come into the presence of the Holy Spirit, Silver was the price of redemption under the Old Testament. And he threw his silver down, but he carried his guilt out the door. He betrayed innocent blood, and they said, what is that to us? You see to it. You see to it. You pay for the innocent blood. And Judas does what so many other people all over the world have done from that day on. Verse 5. So he threw down the silver and he departed and he went and he hanged himself. And so what many people do when they walk into the guilt and condemnation of failure is they give their penance at the feet of God and then they carry their guilt outside of his presence and they hang themselves on their own guilt and their own... I'm not talking about suicide. I'm talking about spiritually. They hang themselves on their own guilt and their own con condemnation because for them, it's all night. And there is no hope for, dark, for light. Some of you have carried for far too long the guilt of your past, the sins of yesterday. And you are hanging yourself on works with them. You are hanging yourself in the presence of God on them. You will not allow yourself to be happy. You will not allow yourself to be at peace. You will not allow yourself to have any joy because you believe you very firmly must pay God back for how bad you treated Him. You have a Judas Iscariot mentality. That may bother you to hear that. But for some, you have a Judas Iscariot mentality. I'm not just talking to those here, but many, many listening all over the world who are hanging themselves on religion every day in the church. Hanging themselves on what does God want me to do for Him? What does God want me to say for Him? What does God want... I heard it my whole life. Every time you came into the house of God, another opportunity to hang yourself was given to you. I remember coming into church and if you had the talent to sing and someone stood up in the church and said, hey, I think old brother Paul ought to sing us a song. And you went, ah, oh, I don't think so. Somebody would get up and say, boy, you ought to use that talent or you're going to lose that talent. And you'd sit there with such guilt and condemnation, afraid that God was going to take your singing voice away if you didn't get up and sing, even though you didn't really even want to. So you'd get up and do it anyway because you believe God needed a sacrifice of praise. And you hung yourself on your own performance and then felt a little bit better when you got back to your pew because you did what you didn't want to. And nobody ever told you it was Judas. But I say to you that so many of us did so many things because we thought we owed God, because we thought we had to pay God back because we did stupid stuff that we knew were wrong, and then we knew we needed to make amends. And what better way to... I can't tell you how many people I witnessed, witnessed to, and it was some pitiful witnessing. How many people I witnessed to because I thought I needed to at least win somebody to Jesus for how bad I had just acted. 
the least I could do is bring somebody into the kingdom. If I was going to think like I had thought last week, at least I ought to get somebody else home if I'm going to do that much damage. I slid the noose around my neck more than once and jumped off the tree. And according to the book of Acts, when Judas jumped off the tree, his bowels gushed out onto the earth. And what strikes me amazing about that is that in that 13th chapter of John, Jesus broke bread, dipped it in sop, and handed it to Judas. And i got to think Judas at least took a taste before he got up and walked out into the night. Which tells me that inside of the bowels of every one of us who've ever hung ourselves on religion is the fresh bread of heaven, the bread of a new covenant. Every one of us hanging ourselves on religion, we don't need another answer given to us in a revival. The answer's already on the inside of us. It's a man named Jesus. And there are people hanging themselves every day and their bowels gush out and what's inside of their bowels is the bread of heaven. The answer has already been given to you and His name is Jesus. The earth received the bowels and the blood of a man named Judas. And not, not one person was redeemed because Judas spilled his blood. Not one life will be changed for the kingdom because you spill your religious blood. Not one. It took me years to understand that. Had Judas waited about six more hours, Jesus was going to hang on a cross and His blood was going to spill on the same dirt. And Jesus' is hanging was going to be for all of us Judases so that His hanging would mean we never have to hang. And there are people hanging themselves on religious performance every day because in their life, it is night forever. The sun has set. Now, I, I want to say this. I'm, I'm, I'm leading into my second character. You can see how the sun is going to come up brightly. I hope we have made it pretty dark so that the sun shines even brighter when we get to our next character. But let me show you one more thing that as I was studying this, the Holy Spirit brought back to me that I remember I used to quote all the time when I would fail. I wish I had known better. It's why I'm trying so hard to equip you so that you don't have to make the same mistakes in religion that I've made. Every time I failed, I would quote this verse. Psalms, give me my next screen. Psalms 51 and 3. I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. I thought it was humble to know Psalm 51 and 3. I thought that if you failed, the, best you, the least you could do is at least acknowledge that your sin, the King James said it, horrifically beautiful. If you understand what I mean. The King James said, my sin is ever before me. Such great English with such a terrible connotation. My sin is ever before me. And I would walk around in the realm of the natural and the spirit believing my sin is ever in front of me. I have to live better than my sin. See, I had done it back here, but I had pulled it in front of me because what I had had was an encounter and then I had allowed darkness to define my moment because I kept my sin in front of me. Now, a lot of Christians applaud this because it's David from the great 51st Psalm and surely David in the 51st Psalm knew what he was talking about. But how many of you know that David is under an old covenant where no doubt his sin was ever before him? Let me tell you how ever before him it was. It was so ever before him that late in his life he sins by numbering the people a sin. It was a sin because you're, when you number them, you're supposed to collect from them. And he didn't. He just numbered them because he didn't have a, he had no faith that he had enough men to win. The same guy that could kill a giant with a rock didn't believe he had enough men to beat the Philistines. And so he numbers them and doesn't receive the collection for the benefit of heaven. And thus he sins. And when God confronts him about his sin, rather than just asking God's forgiveness like he did when he sinned with Bathsheba, he receives the punishment 
and builds an altar to appease God. I think it's because his sin with Bathsheba was still in front of him. He, he kept it in front of him every day. The murder and the adultery he kept in front of him. Every, how many of you know that's the wrong place for your sin? Where should your sin be? Look, look at this. I'm going to show you Old, Te Old Testament. Look at this. Next screen. Isaiah 38, 17. Indeed, it was for my own peace that I had great bitterness. But you have lovingly delivered my soul from the pit of corruption. You have cast all my sins behind your back. Thank God. Notice the front half of the verse. It was for my own peace that I was bitter. I thought that I could give myself peace through a bitter walk until the day I realized that my sins are not ever before me. My sins are always behind your back. Do you know what happened behind his back? At Calvary, when the Father and the Son passed between the pieces of sacrificial offering and a new covenant was cut, all of your sins died in that darkness. You don't have to live in that darkness anymore because it's not sunset for the believer. It's sunrise. If your sins today are in front of your face, they're in the wrong place. They're behind God's back. And you're in Christ. And Christ is in God. So they ought to be behind yours. Don't think you're being super spiritual by quoting my sins are ever before me. If you're still quoting my sins are ever before me, you're being super Jewish. Not super new covenant. Your sins are not ever before you. Your sins are behind God's back. Is that good news to anybody else? My goodness. I, I've spent so much time in the dark. I'm just excited today to tell you that the sun's not always setting. The sun is rising. Judas's final failure is found in the fact, you can go back and read this when you get home. In Acts chapter 1, the, the apostles are about to get a new apostle. They need 12. And they say, he must have witnessed the resurrection of our Lord. What disqualifies Judas is that he never saw the life that came out of the tomb. And what qualifies you as a believer is that you haven't hung yourself on your past performance. You have allowed the life of Christ to come out in you and define you as a resurrected being. Now, that took me a while to cover Judas, his darkness. But watch how bright the sun shines. Same 13th chapter of John, different character, same Jesus. We've had Judas, Jesus, and now we'll have Jesus and Peter. John chapter 13, we head towards the end of the chapter, verse 36. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterwards. Where he's going is not heaven, it's the cross. Okay? Where I'm going, you won't follow me now, but you will follow me after, 37. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I'm, I will lay down my life for your sake. This is what I'm prepared to do for you, Jesus. 38. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for my sake? Most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster shall not crow until you have denied me three times. Another gospel says the rooster will crow twice before you have denied me three times. So Jesus has just identified what is going to be Peter's issue. What, what happens to Peter? He doesn't betray Jesus and sell him for 30 pieces of silver, but he denies that he knows him. He warms his hand by the fire and denies that he's with the Galilean. He, he curses God. He runs away from that little woman who's questioning him that night while the, while the Son of God is, die, is being condemned to die in a room nearby. Peter denies this same man who said he would stand for God, doesn't stand for God, and yet the chapter doesn't close dark. It closes with light. Did you catch it? The rooster is going to crow, Peter. I think the comparison between Judas and Peter is sensational. In Judas, he went outside and it was night. In Peter, it's not going to be night forever because what happens when a rooster crows? The sun's coming up. Jesus is saying to Peter, the sun is going to come up 
on your failure. Put your failure behind you, Peter. You are not going to be a child of the dark. That rooster is going to crow and that means the sun is coming up on a brand new day. You don't have to be defined as Peter the denier if you don't want to be. Because when the sun comes up, you can walk into the light and you can be who you're destined to be and who you're called to be. Did Peter get it? Look at the next one. Acts chapter 3 verse 13, it's Peter preaching. What a sermon. Look at what he says. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. Please underline the word denied. If I were to ask you today, which disciple betrayed Jesus, you would say Judas. If I were to ask you which disciple denied Jesus, you would say Peter. Would you be correct? Yes. Judas betrayed him. Peter denied him. Where does Peter get the right in Acts chapter 3, verse 13? To accuse the Jews in Jerusalem of denying Jesus. Next verse, 14. But you deny... Oh, there it is again. But you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. 15 and killed the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. How could he go from being one who denied Jesus to being one in his first sermon to his Jewish friends in Acts 3? There is not one hint, not one hint, that Peter denied the Lord. Not one. He didn't even compare it for humor's sake. I denied him, you denied him. Look at me, now look at you. That might be what we would do. Peter acts as if it never happened. The greatest testimony to the sunrise of God in your life through the finished work of Jesus is you do not have to be defined by what you used to be. You can start over in Jesus. You don't have to be defined by your father's sins. You don't have to be defined by your religious upbringing. You don't have to be defined by what you did last year. By what you, you don't have to be defined by last night. Why? Because for the believer, the sun is always coming up. The rooster always crows and reminds you that in Christ, it is always a brand new day. This is why the early church fathers kept telling the church, you are not children of the darkness. You are children of the light. Walk as if it is day. Walk because you're children of light. Why did they keep saying that? Because everyone who had rejected Jesus was living in the dark. But everyone who knew Him knew they were living in the light. Even if all hell was breaking loose around them, they were confident. They were standing in the eye of the storm. They were at the most peaceful place a man could be because they were at the place where nothing can be shaken. They were at the heartbeat of the sun of righteousness shining in their lives. They were at perfect peace. This Peter, who had denied Jesus, never brings it up. When he writes his final letter, 2 Peter, I think he gives us a glimpse, an insight, into a man who finally acknowledges that he got the message. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed which you do well to heed as a light shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises. Where? In your hearts. I'm not talking about an external daylight. I'm talking about a day star that rises up in your heart. Why does the sun have to rise in your heart? Because it's God's way of telling you that in the believer, it is never night again. What you used to be has hung with Him at Calvary. Don't hang yourself on it. It has hung with Him at Calvary. Sunset, sunrise. Encounters with Jesus can go unheeded. You can walk back into the condemnation of darkness. Or you can heed the call of the Master. He's just asking you to live in the same room with Him and let the sun rise in your heart. 
For more information about Paul White Ministries and how you can become one of Paul's partners, visit us online at www.paulwhiteministries.org. That's www.paulwhiteministries.org. Have a blessed day and may God richly bless you.